Welcome everyone to our final, the third and final Conversation That Matter panel discussion. In the beginning, the first one we heard from men and women who have previously been incarcerated and spent decades in prison. And they told their story about coming home after those many years in, prisons, in prison. Then we heard from mothers and grandmothers about the reality of losing a child to violence and to incarceration. And tonight, we will hear about the reality of young people living in our community. Initially, we were gonna have young people up here and we were gonna have them tell their own story with their own voices. But in between the time that we were planning the panel discussion and today, so many of our young people have went through some real loss and some trauma. And so we didn't want them to be on live carrying all that trauma. And so we will hear from them. We'll hear from them at a later time about the realities of living in the south, on the south side of Chicago. But tonight we're gonna to hear from some experts, if you will, those who accompany young people on a daily basis. And they'll tell about their experiences and no doubt the experiences of some of our young people. So I reiterate, we'll hear from our young people. And so there is a question and chat uh, part of the Zoom. So yet, if you have questions for our young people, put those in the chat and we'll get those to the young people for a later time. I have a few questions that I'm going to prompt a discussion here among those panelists here. But we really look for you to add your own questions, to make this a conversation, not just here at PBR, but with all you who are uh, taking part in this discussion. What's it like to accompany young people on the south side? So if you have questions, please ask those questions in the Q&A or the chat uh, part of Zoom. But I'd like to begin with an opening. Uh, oftentimes when we do these discussions or have circles, we have an opening. And this opening is a piece, a spoken word piece by Andrew Kirk Reedus. So I invite you to take a listen. Hello, <laughs> my name is Andrew Kirk Reedus, hyphenated last name too. <laughs> and this is a spoken word poem titled, Who Am I? Who am I? A question I ask, but I'm afraid to answer. Yet the question is like a malignant tumor permeating my mind like cancer. So since the question is continuously posed, it demands an answer because my identity has been misrepresented by history's tamper. Am I part of the majority amongst the minority who views oneself for what one's truly am? Royalty. Was I born from the womb of a queen, raised and bred by the teachers of a king? Therefore, am I supreme? Royalty. Am I a descendant of the motherland? Well, it was projected outwardly who we were in our glory. What well, knowledge itself wasn't omitted through the editing of his story. Nonfiction, true story. Kings and queens reign free, so how could royalty be forced to kneel and take a knee? Shackled and bound, wrist to ankles on barges, set and sail across the Atlantic Ocean and sea, brought to these northern shores of alien civilization, being subjected and treated as worse than what is beneath our feet. Tell me, is this who I be? Because I'm confused between the contradictions of the lies my teacher taught me and 
what was taught from those before me concerning my identity. I was taught that all means everything and mighty means great. Therefore, I'm almighty in any state. My knowledge itself contains the gravity of the combined weight of all that influenced me throughout our history to who I am to this date. Therefore, I cannot mistake. No, mistake the impact of an answer to this question posed rhetorically. Am I one of the few that was chosen out of the many that was called to bring in like me to a nation that endured egregious trials and tribulations and instead of yielding to stagnation, I advocated education through stimulation of revelation, become a part of a solution to the preconceived problem that we as a people were facing, never impeding the progress of our destined elevation though. Who am I? Am I woke? Due to my being asleep and having a dream, become a part of the 5% that realize everything ain't what it seems and not the 85% that don't even recognize what any of this even mean? Unconscious kings. Wait, is that even really a thing? Was I one as well as a million men who marched not meek on DC? Dream chasing, non complying with the state of affairs, civil disobedient until what was wrong was put in order, which was recognition of who we are as a nation, forcing acknowledgement of the truth history was running from. Keep racing, facts, keep pacing. History was drawn outside the line so you couldn't trace it, yet there's no erasing the imprints our ancestors left upon this earth's ground. And heavy is the head that wears the crown. Because embedded in our DNA and forever flowing through our veins was a conscious growl. Heard from those who prowled the concrete jungles as Black Panthers, unrelated, but Wakanda forever, because a similar message of unity was advocated in us standing together. And just as upon us was the tether to prompt us to engage our communities and get a narrative that we be better. Now, am I true to self for choosing not to acquiesce to an identity crisis, but chose to address the reality that history's blasphemy forced my furies fuse to burn so short to transition to the realization that <laughs> wait, y'all don't know me. Because by any means necessary, the fruits of falsehood tried to X me out. Even while I was peering behind the curtain at the design like Malcolm at the same time, gripping something in the palm of my mind to keep my peace of mind in line. And alter your visuals of how you see me by charging it to the price of inequality for not being able to walk down the street in my hoodie with my candy store goodies or taking 16 shots from a cop who took it upon himself to decide that my life don't matter. I can't breathe. This is what transpires between myself and the world and me. A clarification that we are cut from a different cloth, meaning I am one of many threads amongst an elaborate fabric intricately woven to display the solidarity, the true meaning of our story being covered, which forces history to uncover the illusions of the present moment, compelling you with an obligation to face a mirror with a question in eye. It's simple yet complex. Ask yourself, who am I? So most of what, let me set a context for our discussion this evening. Uh, after years of working with young people, both here in Chicago and elsewhere, uh, but mostly here on the south side of Chicago, what I, my experience is that most young people know someone, a family member or friend who has been killed, has been harmed. And they also don't, the second thing is they don't feel safe walking from say PBMR to the park which is less than a block away. And the third thing that is most troubling to me at least, or one of the troubling things to me at least, is they do not believe that adults have their back, that adults can or will protect them. Add all that with a lot of guns in our neighborhood, you have a 14 year old carrying a gun because he's afraid, because he feels as though he's out here on his own. And so that's kind of the context of what we're, what we're talking about here today. Most people hear about our young people via the news, via the media. And as I said before, we really wanted our young people here to speak their own voice, tell their own stories. And we'll do that. But tonight we're going to have a, a group of panelists, all who have lots of experience in accompanying young people through both their joys and also their difficulties. And so I've been doing this for a long time, and it's a joy for me, it's an honor for me to be in the company with these four panelists. So I'm gonna ask them to introduce themselves and tell a little bit about their role, how they accompany young people here at PBMR. So I'll start with you, Marlon. If you could just 
Tell a little bit about yourself um, and how you will come to young people here at PBMR. Um, Marlon, Marlon Gosa. Um, I'm a um, service navigator, youth mentor, um, advocate. Um, I accompany youth every day um, throughout the back of the yards, New City, Inglewood, throughout the Chicago area, probably some even outside of the Chicago area. And just um, ensuring that, you know, they have a basic needs, um, making sure that they um, try to stay on goal with, they, with, with, with whatever track of path they want to take in life. Um, really, that's about it. Hello, uh, my name is Fred Wotherspoon. I am uh, the service coordination navigation uh, supervisor. Uh, I also supervise another program. I supervise the mentoring program. Uh, so in, in the service coordination and navigation program, that program consists of, uh, it's, it's Inglewood based program in which we service uh, youth in between the ages of, of 14 and 24. Uh, the idea is to have the hardest to serve youth, uh, just as involved youth uh, service, right? So, so what that looks like for me and, and, and for, my, uh, for my peers who, who work with this population is uh, it's, it's a mixture of, 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 of mentoring, uh, workforce development, uh, job placement, uh, family engagement. Uh, it, it's sort of all those things, the, 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 the complete service model wrapped up into one program. Uh, so that's, that's one program. But but you know uh, my original like what my heart is my heart is set with that but what my heart is really set with is with the mentoring program uh, that's a program based in, in uh, New City slash back of the yards neighborhood uh, back of the yard neighborhood we service close to to thirty five youth in between the ages of, of thirteen and, and eighteen for the most part uh, so yes that's that's what I do here at Precious Blood yeah. name is Philip Jordan. Uh, job coach slash job readiness case manager, pretty much help with uh, youth and other participants uh, with job placement, uh, teaching them soft skills, and try to get them on track for like career oriented things. Um, also, I had a program called Project Revive. Pretty much it's like a wraparound service program to kind of like get guys job readiness education if they need it, if they need a high school diploma. So that's pretty much what I do. Thanks, Philip. Denny. I'm Denny Kinderman, a missionary of the Precious Blood Priest. Been with the uh, Precious Blood Ministry of Reconciliation from the very beginning. Um, next year, we're going to celebrate the 20th anniversary of PBMR. Um, I like to say when people say, well, what do you really do here? I like to say, I just show up because there's always uh, things going on. But I want to focus tonight on my visits to the juvenile detention center, Cook County uh, Detention Center, where there's always a few hundred youth, mainly uh, young males, um, incarcerated up to any age, up to age 18. Um, Father Kelly and myself go there uh, two nights a week, and uh, I want to talk about those visits uh, tonight. Thank you all. Appreciate that. So, Philip, what's the most rewarding part of your work in accompanying the young people? What, what really gives you joy um, as you work with young people? Um, <clears throat> when I first started off, I used to try to measure successes on guys graduating college and getting a seven figure salary job and all this other stuff, but it's not realistic. So I had to learn to look for the silver lining and things, you know, celebrate the little things. So going to take them to get the ID, take them to get the driver's license, um, job placement, you know, uh, completing the job readiness class seeing them happy that they get a certificate at the end. You know, those little things, getting their first paycheck, taking them to cast their first paycheck when they get their first job, uh, coaching them on how to pay utility bills. And so that's my joy, the small things. 
Right. What, what's, what gives you joy and wakes you up in the morning and ready to go work and working with our young people? Well, well, well for me, it, it's, it's, it, it revolves around the relationships. Uh, so, so one of the things that was emphasized to me when I first started at Precious Blood, which is close to three years now, <laughs> a time is, yes, yeah, it goes quickly. Uh, it's the relationship. So, 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 and what I mean by that is actually building and establishing a relationship uh, with our youth. Uh, you know, sort of presenting myself as the as the trusting figure uh, who they can come to, right? Uh, no judgments. Uh, you know, and they come as they are, right? Uh, so, so, and it plays out in many forms, right? So, th there will be a kid who who's who's faced with some bad choices, right? Uh, you know. Choice one, choice one A is bad. Choice two A is even worse, right? Uh, but to have that youth reach out to me, right, to confide in me, uh, you know, with 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 the expectation that I can lead them into making better choices, right? Uh, that's extremely rewarding, right? To to have a youth put this faith in me to say, I'll 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 allow you to lead me. I'll allow you uh, to give me some advice, right? Uh, you know, it, it's, 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 it's extremely rewarding. Uh, yeah, that's one of my, you know, relationship building component. I really enjoy it. How about you, Marlon? Yeah, I, <clears throat> like Fred said, uh, I really enjoy the relationship part, um, but you, you become very attached with these young men. I mean, we spend lots and lots of hours with them. Um, they become like family members. Um, the smiles, I mean, it, it, it's just so enjoyable just to see them smile because you, you, you know, when we walk in with them, we walk not only through the happy times, but we walk through those sad times and we know the trauma and all the things that they face um, because we deal with it really hand in hand, like hand in hand combat with them as they going through it. So when even though after all of that pain, they suffer and just to see them smile and be happy at a, at a point at that, whether if it's them getting their first driver's license or whatever. I mean, it's just so enjoyable to know that when I come, I'm making that, you know, I give them that hope that say, hey, look, we can make it through. We're going to get through through the next day. It, it, life is not over. We're here, you know, regardless of the bumps or whatever they might grow through in, in life. Mm -hmm. So that's Thanks. definitely. Thanks, Mark. Thank oh, I got to be honest. Um, every Tuesday and Thursday night, um, around five o'clock when it's time for me to be going to the detention center. I'm thinking like, oh my God, I'm, you know, I'm tired. I just soon go home and have a cold beer. And, but the reason I go is because I know that every time when I'm leaving around nine o'clock in the evening, I'm just so filled with, I just feel so good and feel like I've cheated the kids. Like I got more out of the visit than, than what they got out of it. And visits like, sometimes can almost bring me to tears. And then there's other times like, let me tell you, um, this one kid, I, I saw him, I said, um, I said, you're back again, huh? Because I had seen him a couple years ago in juvenile. Yeah, I said, well, how old are you now? He said, I'm 15, how old are you? I said, well, I'm 81. And he said, oh, you don't have long to live. <laughs> and then he said, I'll pray for you. So, you know, you, you never know what you're going to meet there. So I had a, a friend come up not too long ago to visit us here at PBMR. And, and so it was during lunchtime, so all the kids were coming in from workforce and coming up and, and introducing themselves to her and shaking her hand and all this good stuff. And as I was driving her back to her hotel after the after uh, the visit, she was just going on and on about, wow, these kids are so polite and so good. There's just this, this energy in this space. And there is. I think we all experience that joy of the energy and the love of these young people who can be so incredibly respectful. But we also know some of their struggles, some of, some of the hardships, because we are building relationships with them. And in those relationships, we are privileged they confide in us some of, some of the struggles they're going through. So I'm going to ask the panel here, what are some of the struggles that the youth are facing in their experience? Um, what might those who are kind of tuning in not really understand about young people growing up today on, on the south side of Chicago? So 
Um, Fred, let me start with you. What are some of the struggles our young people are going through? Well, uh, uh, so so I'll start with a confession. Uh, so when I uh, when I first started in this role, uh, you know, a little background on me. I am uh, what they call a returning citizen. I was incarcerated for for twenty five years uh, mm -hmm. of my life. I left at seventeen and, and got out at forty two. Uh, and I had a notion of how you interact with youth when you get out. And it was this. It was simple, right? It was I tell my story, they accept my story and make better choices, right? Right? Just sort of simple. Like you don't want to go down the path that Fred went through. But but what I quickly realized was 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 that was not the case, right? That's now how life is lived. That's now how it's seen because that's not the reality of the youth out here. And, and what I mean by that is 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 the sort of the consistent trauma, the, the legacy-based trauma that the youth are, are, are dealing with. And, and how that plays out is, is, is uh, you know, most of our youth have parents who have been through sort of trauma, right? Uh, their parents before them been through trauma, right? So they grow up in, in what I like to call this, this, this oil pit, right? <laughs> you know, like this pit of oil, and they're asked to, to navigate through that, right? Uh, which is unfair to them, right? So, 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 one of the more uh, sort of revelations for me was 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 how big the trauma was, how how sort of consuming it was, right? How how it wasn't just the youth, right? In and of itself, it was the family, right? It was it was the single parent, right? Uh, struggling to pay rent, right? And the ripple effects that that has on on a household, on a youth, right? The pressure that puts on that young person uh, to provide, right, to, to to go out and earn, right. Uh, so compound that with the fact that you know most of these youth, you know, for the most part, don't have skills, right, that makes money, right. So that put them in the position to be desperate, and, and desperate people do desperate stuff, right. Uh, and, and 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 a lot of times they can't pull themselves out of those predicaments because they don't understand that, right. They just understand. Uh, 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 the situation they're in, and, 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 the, and the path they see to get out of the situation is not, you know, what we consider the best choices, right? So, uh, sort of just getting a, a, a feel for that and understanding that in this totality uh, was a revelation for me, uh, you know. And it was like, okay, uh, uh, this is not even about the youth so much. It's about our society. It's about our community, right? It's about our, our neighborhood. It's about the adults, right? Mm. Uh, you know, what are we going to do right, <laughs> to, to address this? Like what, you know, uh, what can we do? So, 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 I mean, uh, you know, sort of, so, so the, the complete trauma that the kids were, were, were asked to raise themselves in was a revelation for me. Yeah. yeah. On, on top of, on top of the trauma, um, it's, it's just a lack of opportunity as well. So when you mix all those things up and then um, the, the, la the opportunity levels is very small for the youth outside the basketball hoops and outside the little small things that's in the community. It's not a lot of, you know, uh, options for them. So everybody don't want to be a football player or everybody don't want to be a basketball player. And the, the community lacks the opportunities of those that want to expand their mind to a different field or a different option. You know, you might want to be a chef or you might want to be an astronaut, but where do we go? Where do we direct them here in our community that's affordable for them to expand their minds and expand those and, and, and chase those dreams? You know, with, and, and with the trauma and, you, and, and there's so many other forces that pulls them the negative way and we don't have as adults we we're not giving them another option to um especially with young men to to release that energy release that you know expand their minds um it, it kind of twinkles down generation after generation after generation you know when i talk to youth in the detention center almost every time i say you know okay if if, if you go home your next court date who is there at home to help you keep you out of trouble or get you know it's always like well my mama my grandma my auntie um 
there's so many of the kids have no um, male role model that that can really that's why they they see yeah. basketball players football yeah. players you know the rappers but um yeah. so many of the kids it's just it's just so sad that um they they really don't have the resources when they go home that's why we try to get as many as we can to come to whatever we're offering but you know um not all the kids that are locked up are from our neighborhood but uh, the ones that are we can help and and, and, and it's it just, so just imagine asking a, a 14 year old or 13 year old to be a provider in a household right because that, that's you know you know that's basically what we're acting for right when, yep. you, when you have a mom who who's out working right because most of the parents right you know parents work right this is not a situation where people are not striving to get ahead right like but but the reality of it so a parents uh, leave and go to work at eight o'clock at night and get home at four o'clock and, and and the kids are left the sort of the man the 13 to 14 year old are left to manage the household right to, to, to maybe look after their their young sisters or brothers and, and, and it's, it's not fair it's not realistic to expect uh, uh you know people to, to get ahead to, to, to you know to to, to, to to prosper in those conditions mm -hmm. right it, it's it's so for, for me it's, it's the lack of, of involvement from the broader community right uh it's, it's stuff that we would never sort of you know I you know we're we all get around in this city, right? We, we can see the different pockets of this city. It's stuff that we would never tolerate in other communities, right? Yeah. You know, in other areas of this city, right? We just, uh, unfortunately, you know, a lot of people just accept and tolerate the, 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 lack, the lack of resources in this community. And it's, it's, it's frustrating, right? It's, it's, it's real frustrating. So, Philip, you grew up in this neighborhood. You came to us as a participant. Um, when there's something going down in the center of the neighborhood and I don't quite get it, which is a lot of times, um, I go to Philip and say, Philip, help me understand this. And Philip is the one I kind of, because he's from the neighborhood and he grew up here at the center as a participant and then now as a job coach and, and a case manager. What's the difference between when you were growing up and your challenges as a young person, as a 14, 15, 16 year old, and what you see as some of the challenges today? Um, in my opinion, uh, the only challenge that's different is maybe like the media, the social media aspect and, uh, like the music, because it's kind of like the same challenges. Like I grew up dealing with, you know, police, I guess you would say police brutality, you know, p picking with you, putting you over for no reason, bothering you. Um, you know, urban conflict, as I like to call it, you know, this group of people not liking your group of people because of y'all, you know, y'all values and beliefs. So, and they kind of, they kind of deal with the same thing. It's just a little, um, I don't want to say worse, but it kind of is in a sense because, like I say, social media play a big aspect. They got to live up to these names and it put them in a bind. You know, so I, I think the I think the challenges are still there, like y'all touched on earlier, lack of resources. Um, I like to say grief with no peace. Um, trauma, uh, you know. Yeah, I like I, I, I like to say I, well, Phil, and remind me of something I say a lot is um, there we overexpose them and undereducate them. So they've been exposed to everything in, under the sun, but not educated on nothing. So, um, you know, things that they know about, I didn't learn until I was uh, an adult. Things that they allowed to do, I would never be able to do until I was an adult. But now because of the media and TV and, and the uh, social media and all these things, I mean, at the, at the, at the push of a button, they, they know about it already. It's like, you know, they, I like to say they overexposed and um, highly undereducated on how to deal with those things, which probably plays a part in trauma too. What do you probably? And, and mix that with the availability of these guns, right? Like, uh, like it, it's, it's just ridiculous how, how, how accessible these guns are in this community. Like I, I am, uh, you know, I am wondering about this, like the accessibility of these guns. Are, is, and so just imagine a, a kid who's 
who's frustrated or angry. Uh, back when I was coming up, right? You, you'll get frustrated and angry and, and you'll have another outlet to express that you'll go home. You'll, you, you maybe have a fight or a fist fight or whatever. Like it wouldn't result in, 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 in somebody going to get a gun or having access or having the ability to go get a gun, right? Uh, and not fully think through the choices of, of that, right? You know, so there's, so, so for me, these, these, these guns, are, um, they are a big problem, a huge problem. Don't know what the answer or the solution is, but I know they are a problem. What's, what's a, a twist in all this? We, we know the violence that's in the streets. We know the, the things the kids can get into. But back before the uh, COVID, Father Kelly and I were able to invite people to come in for just a one-time visit to the detention center. And the thing they would always comment on after the visit, they said, wow, this, I didn't see what I thought I was gonna see. You know, they, they begin to think that all the kids that are locked up are just mean kids, you know. They said, I kind of felt like I was talking to my nephew or niece or, you know, a family member. And they, they saw the good side of the kids, you know. And um, some of them would actually get teary-eyed just, just having that experience. So, you know, I think that's, that's kind of what keeps me going too, because a lot of times we just see things that, that would basically want to turn us off, but you just know because of the trauma, because of everything else going on in their lives, you know, these kids are good. I, I tell the kids all the time in juvenile, you know, that God made you good. You are a good person. You maybe you're here because you made a mistake, but you know, there are people right now who are very successful because they've learned from a mistake they made. So, you know, um, there's always hope. Yeah, kind of picking up on what you said, Fred, too, is, and everybody I think is saying, it's not just the kids, it's the society, it's the community in which we live in. You know, we have these values or principles, or we call them pillars, one of them is radical hospitality because we want young people to be in the building. They're precisely the people we want in these spaces, this place. And they're not invited oftentimes in other spaces. They're not wanted in other spaces because they don't always come, you know, chipper and ready to meet the world in a good way. They're, they're, the young people experience trauma and they live out of that trauma sometimes. The other piece is we, we're not a referral source. We're a, we a company. We walk alongside. And that's what this panel, what we're talking about is really walking alongside. The other thing is we're relentlessly engaging them. You know, we ne there's never a time in which a young person is not invited to be a part of here, unless they do damage to somebody or make it unsafe, and then we work with them outside the building. And I have a ton of uh, patience for a 14-year-old who acts like a 14-year-old, you know, but I often say I don't have as much patience for uh, a system that acts like a 14-year-old. And I think so often some of our responses to what we're talking about is a system that's acting like a 14 year old you did bad so i'm going to do bad to you even more and so i think we have to get at, at some of the underlying causes of some of the the trauma and the pain and the hurt and the violence that's happening within our community so marlon you've been working with young people for a long time you grew up in this neighborhood you work with younger middle-aged or middle-aged uh, middle school age kids and and some older um, you have raised your own children in this neighborhood what do you think we really need to be about in our neighborhood? What does what this neighborhood and neighborhoods like us need most? Um, unity. Um, I think as um, we need to set aside a lot of the differences that we carry as adults and as a whole. I mean, we all sit here, family, we all have different walks and ways of life. And the children kind of see, see that from the outside when things are um, chaotic and when chaotic as in maybe this organization against this organization or this church it, it, it's like everybody's all over the place when we should just be together because we got one common interest one common goal um why can't we be this one coalition that this one movement that we all just move together and create those opportunities that i said we we lacked um earlier for, for the for the youth and throughout the community the if we can create more opportunities for them, um create more outlets outside of, i mean pbmr uh we need 
I mean, everybody, everybody can come and do whatever part. Everybody need to play and do whatever they part. We need to move like, like that football team where everybody's doing their part mm -hmm. and just moving forward and just making life better for the whole household, not only the child, but the whole household, the whole family, you know, it's, um, so, so Philip, what about that? What do you think our community needs? You've been in this community, you grew up in this community. What do you see, think some of the things that our community needs? Uh, outside of resource, obviously. Um, like Marlon said, um, you know, just that sense of unity again. I remember like when I was younger, um, I ain't that old, but <laughs> I remember, you know, we could be able to go from like block to block and wouldn't have to worry about anything. But now like everything is so divided. You know, it's like Marlon said, we all got the same common goal, whether this, you know, whether you uh, GD from that mm -hmm. Halstead or you Blackstone, you want the best for your people, you want the best for your family. So, and it starts with us, you know, as much as we need the resource, you know, we as a people got to pull ourselves up by the bootstraps and do it on our own. So the village needs to be the village. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yep. We need to be like the Smurfs, <laughs> you know, <laughs> everybody working and getting it done. <laughs> yeah, that sense of community, though, that's what we need again. So, Denny, you've been doing this work for a long time. I credit Denny as to why I'm a priest. Uh, before I was, or when I, between uh, college and grad school, I lived with him in Cincinnati in, a, in an African American parish that changed the course. And that's where I got introduced to jails and things like that. And it really changed the course of my life uh, drastically in a good way. Um, you go to Juvenile Detention Center, you've been doing this for years. How has that kind of work really um, impacted you? How's it made you? And I'm going to say this as a leading thing. How that made you a better person, better priest? I began to find out all the things I didn't know. I didn't realize that uh, the experiences that I was hearing from these uh, young people were just touching me in such ways. Um, it just reminds me of uh, you know what Brian Stevenson says about. Um, he says, we have to look at how we treat poor people, people who are accused, and people who are incarcerated, because that's a reflection of how we see justice. And justice to me has always been reconciliation. Justice is like, how do we really get things uh, into right relationship? where we're, you know, justice within the community is when we can all come together. And, and it's like when you do that, when I listen to these kids, um, I'm beginning to get a feel for uh, their cry for mercy. And it's like, we say, hurt people hurt people. And I, I begin to see where people who are in touch with the need for mercy know how to be merciful. I mean, I've learned so much from these kids. It, it's incredible. And um, it's just, it's so humbling. And, and I'm just, you know, I'm eternally thankful that, that I get the opportunity to just go and listen to these kids. We were having a drumming circle one time. And you think, you know, these hard kids, the circles we'd have, we do with kids who are charged as adults. You need to know that in the juvenile detention center, some of those kids are charged as adults, which means as soon as they turn 18, they send them to the adult jail and they go on. A lot of times they end up in prison. So we have these kids in a, in a drumming circle and they can become very vulnerable when they're in a drumming circle. And this one time, this one kid started sharing something that was about his mother and he got teary-eyed. And one of the other kids got up, walked over and gave him a hug. You know, it, it's like when I see these kind of things and I know, they know what it feels like to need mercy and they know how to be merciful and loving and kind. It's just like, I'm blessed that I, I can't wait till tomorrow night I go back in and see what's gonna <laughs> yeah. happen. You know, sometimes I, I talk to it's... 20 kids in one night, just. Yeah. 
it's the, it's it's natural for them to be good. I mean, that's our natural state of of of, right. of mind. We taught to be bad, and a lot of the times, it's easy to get rid of that bad uh, that bad part that you've been taught and pull it back to that good. Right. If we just um, find a way to reach down, reach down in it, and you know, find that core. Um, mm -hmm. you know, just that core part of that person and bring it out. And, and a lot of the times it's real, even the baddest ones, when we, we talking with them one-on-one, -on -one, it's like, you can't be the kid. <laughs> right. here's, a, here's a fact uh, that every adult of a certain age and experience in maturity level know about, about kids, about young kids. Most, and that is this, that most of this stuff is age-centered, right? So, so, so you get these 14, 15 year olds making bad choices, the decision at these ages, uh, the likelihood of them being the same person at 24, 25, 26, 27, doesn't, you, you know, they're not the same people at these ages, right? And we know that, right? Like society mm -hmm. knows that, right? I personally, I, I can attest to that. Like I, I am much different uh, at 45 than I was at 17, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, but society wants to, to sort of judge me at, at that age for the rest of my life, right? You know what I mean? And, and hold me to those standards of a 70 year old when I'm, you know, whatever age I am, right? Mm -hmm. And we know that, right? And, and we also know uh, that, 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 you know, you, you can, you know, for the most part, society invests in what they see as important and people they see as contributors, important members of society, right? Uh, and for whatever reason, they don't see our youth in this community as, as contributors or as important members of society going forward, right? So they didn't invest in them, right? Mm -hmm. They don't care, right? You know right. what I mean? Uh, I mean, it's bluntly, that's what it is. It's, you know, so, uh, I mean, so to get society to, 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 to fully understand and appreciate the fact that most of this stuff is age related, they're going to age out of these bad decision making processes, right? Right? They'll get better, right? You know what I mean? We can't throw them away. You know, we can't. Like, mm -hmm. it's not, you know, the option of, okay, maybe we can ignore them, or, but we can't. We got to invest in them what we invest in all the other kids who, who, mm -hmm. who prosper and get ahead in society. And that, that is, it's not to go on too long. <laughs> so so I, was in, I was in the IDOC. Uh, 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 I was in Menard. This is like in the southern part of Illinois. Uh, and, and, and I was around... A lot of the staff that were farmers, right? Uh, well, they was they were children of farmers. They were jail workers because, you know, the farm had been closed down. Everybody was working in the prison now. And I say this to say, you know, they were they were potentially farmers or, or was growing up as farmers because that's what the community produced, right? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. uh, our community don't produce that, like uh, you know, for the most it, it, it produces other stuff, in which they will eventually grow out of if we stay invested in them, right? If we continue to show them. Like our radical hospitality, our love, our, our understanding, what accountability, right? We're not saying not hold people accountable for, for stuff. We're not asking for that. We're saying be realistic about who this young person is and the state they are in at these ages, right? You know? So, yeah, more just. So, oh, not to cut you off, no, but more so attack the why, not the person. Yes. Yes. So, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yes. Don't persecute the person. Persecute the system that made that person do what he did in the first place. Yeah, not even only that. The, the why he come in with his hair all over. Mm -hmm. You know, some of these kids, um, they come in with their hair all over because they don't just have a comb. Yeah. It's not that he's a maniac. You know, mm -hmm. so you 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 shut him down because you like what's wrong with him. Yeah. But did you find out the why his hair is like that? Did you find out the why he has? You know, he he. He's looking a different or, or acting different. Yeah, look. Like, yeah. Restorative justice says, don't ask what'd you do, ask what happened. Yes. So what happened is an understanding question. What'd you do is a judgment question or a statement. So we gotta get, I know we gotta get at the question and answer stuff. <laughs> we could go on forever here, as you can tell. Um, a lot of wisdom here, a lot of experience, decades of experience here. So. There, there's a, a question in the beginning that what would motivate someone to come to PBMR, a young person? What would motivate a young person to come to PBR? We don't have a lot in our community. There's not a lot of resources in our community. There's not a lot of institutions. It's, it's us, a couple of schools, a couple of churches. 
Uh, no big anchor here in, uh, in, in the back of the yards, this part of the neighborhood. So what would motivate a young person to come to PBMR? Well, I know for me, when I was younger, I didn't want to be on the streets. <laughs> so I came here, you know, we got weights, pool tables. So I came here to keep myself occupied. So, so a lot of times the kids, they just want to be understood. And we allow them that opportunity to express themselves, even though sometimes it may be a little chaotic. That <laughs> radical hospitality kick in, and we still allow them to be they selves. And um, we 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 learn a lot about that person while allowing them to be they selves. We learn that why, and we I think it kind of. Um, creates that family atmosphere that they come in and they see me and Fred and father and they look at us as family members you know they look they you know it's more than just that we're a center or there's somewhere they can go it becomes you know almost like they second home they like I want to go to the center you know some of the kids that are in juvenile who are in our neighborhood and I tell them about the center and they say oh can I come there and get a state ID you know whatever is your need but here again you know why don't why doesn't the system make sure that when they leave juvenile detention they already have their state ID? you know but anyhow i just had to throw that in <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well one of the reasons they come here i think from my perspective is because there's no other place in which some of their needs are being met All right and so it can be as simple as food yeah um they come in here and get you know we go through a lot of milk and cereal yeah um, come here and get something to eat it's it's that simple but i really believe it's part of why they come here is because of you all, because of the relationships you have. Because I've seen how when Fred walks through the hall or Philip or Marlon or Denny or others, that they 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 change some of their 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 dialogue and because they have respect and they're treated with respect. It's a mutual, as Greg Boyle constantly tells us, it's mutuality. Um, we take care of one another. Yeah. And and it's a safe space, right? It's, yeah. it's a space that everybody feels uh you know, it's not a threatening situation. Like you can actually come in and relax uh, and, and, and be at peace, right? Uh, I don't, you know, that that's important for kids to, to feel safe, to have a, a space where they can uh, just be kids, right? You know, uh, just be kids. <laughs> and they also know that we, I mean, regardless, even if they agree with us, they know that we have the best intention, we have the best, you know, we're, we're, we're their companion. We walking with them, you know, regardless. We we want what's best for them regardless of what we I think sometimes we want it more than they do yeah, okay. but um and they understand that I, I mean I've even walked in outside of the doors when when we elsewhere and uh they respond to us like that and you go in the classroom and the classroom is just quiet I just want to add never that, that we don't have a woman on the panel tonight but you need to know we, we also uh service young ladies through different programs that we have too so it's not just all about boys, it's about the uh, young ladies too. And if you saw the first of these series on Monday night, then you saw what Sister Donna Liette does with the mothers and uh, the programs for the women too. So don't want yeah, to the, leave them out. The woman who was going to, Marshana was going to be on our panel, but her basement flooded. So she's <laughs> pumping out water. So I'm sure she'd rather be here. One of the questions, this is a good question. It comes from Steve. He's got a, a lot of questions here, but. You know, we talk a lot about our young people and what we strive to do with our young people and accompanying them and, and helping them get back to school and all the other things. How do we address racism and other kinds of conditions, systemic conditions, systemic violence, if you will, um, that our young people have to have to deal with? So I'll go first. Uh, so for me, you know, uh, there's a couple of base issues that's, that's super important. And the number one is housing, right? Uh, I've, I've sort of given this example to a, to a few people about when I originally started uh, in this space working. How in the you know there was this one kid who who uh, who was originally living in the community when I like when I first started. Within three months of me being there, he moved to another community, right? Uh, and then within four to five months of that, they were out in another community. It was further further out. Uh, and, and the reason for that was, was the housing situation was just so unstable, right? So 
uh, you know, you're getting people who can't afford to stay, even stay in this community, right? And this is not the most wealthiest of communities, right? This sort of a, a sort of lower working class community. And if you can't afford to stay here, what can you live in, right? So, so housing has been central, right? You know, just just think all the consequences of unstable housing, right? You're, you're constantly transferring in and out of these different schools, right? Uh, people don't have stable employment, uh, and you you don't get the chance to actually build community in your community because you don't have a community, right? You're, you're constantly moving. So, uh, I think housing is is, is 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 sort of the most important issue combined with, with sort of work opportunities in the community, like actual job opportunities uh, in this community. I, I think you need those things as, as, as sort of the base in which you can build from. Uh, so housing has been super important for me. Yeah. I think we also have done uh, circle training for different uh, elements of people who work within the uh, justice system. And um, the whole idea there is to make people more aware of restorative justice versus punitive justice. Yeah, one of the things I say oftentimes is relational first and programmatic second. In other words, we build relationships with our families, our mothers, our uh, young people, and out of those relationships, they inform us what they need. So that's why we work, do workforce development. That's why we do uh, case management, mentoring, because they long for a caring adult in their life. And we know Research tells us that a young person is much more resilient if he has a young person or has an, a, an adult in their life, somebody they can turn to, somebody they can count on. And that's hugely important because sometimes we can't change this, the systems, but we can we can help our young people be more resilient against those those kinds of oppressive oppressive forces. And that's kind of what I was going to say. I kind of try to get them to like establish some sort of like uh, self confidence and like empowerment. So. That way, you know, um, they can be better, and then in turn, they can make the area better and make the community better, and hope probably make the world better. So, start with me, and with the world. That's right. So we've talked a lot about what we we haven't talked a lot about what we do. So we do arts, we do workforce development, we do a lot of those things. The core of our work though is relationships. The core of our work is this. That's why it's a restorative justice kind of philosophy that we build relationships with one another. Um, everybody needs society, everybody needs a community. But one of our, Christy asks, what other resources are needed um, in our community? What, if we had the resources, what would we do with it? What are some of the needs? Well, it's probably easy to say what are not the needs. We don't need anyone to stand on the sidelines. We need whatever, I mean, I think, I, um, Whatever resource um, is available, I think it need to be um, put here or established here in the community. And, and they don't really have, a lot of the times we think resources as monetary or money, and we always need money. That's absolute, absolutely a plus, but it can be just you helping out with something that you know. You can be a librarian and say, OK, uh, donate that time and say, I'm going to work with this young lady that wants to be a librarian and show her how to be it. Or I'm going to teach this person. You know, it could be um, just whatever, whatever um, I want to say God puts on your heart that you can better change um, and improve the life of, of, of not only the child, but any uh, uh, another family or a household. So it's hard to put a label on what resources needed because it's so many that, that there's so much that is needed. It's like you need everything, right. you know, we, it, what don't we need? Yeah, yeah, in that question, I, I get a lot from a lot of people, like what resources, uh, like there's this magic sort of thing that we need. Uh, we need the resources that every other community has. Right? Yeah. We mm -hmm. need good schools. We need good housing, good affordable housing. Uh, like we need the same resources you have in your community, right? Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So it's, it's, not a, it's not a mystery, right? Yeah. Like, uh, you know, <laughs> I was going to say that level the playing field, yeah. you know. It should be no reason why like a guy that's growing up in Oak Park uh, in Homewood, how he knows he's going to college. But me, I'm stuck between Find a job, going to the military. Yeah. That was yeah. my only two options going, you know, graduating high school. So 
just level the playing field, like Fred was saying. Make yeah. people hopeful. As a good friend of mine, we were at one of these meetings uh, yet again about you know strategies and things like that, and she just raised her hand. It's an African American woman. She says, "Our young people need what the what your the North Side that she was Absolutely. saying that the North Side has. You yeah. know, the same thing. You know, program after school programming, yeah. Yeah. Um, all those kinds of things that go into the night. Yeah. Whereas here, three thirty schools it. are shuttered." Yeah, and there then, is no after then they come here. Then we wrap up about six or seven, because we got to go home to our families. And then and... you go like you were saying earlier. They latchkey kids, I think is a term. Their parents might be out working at night. So now they out and for themselves. So. Brian Stevenson talks about closeness, mm -hmm. and you just kind of wonder what would happen if all of a sudden we would just really mix everybody up, you know, and it wouldn't be like south side west side and all it just be we'd all start living together closer together and you know what would happen yeah gotta change the narrative huh? <laughs> so we got a little bit more time so i'm just gonna go you know, what else do we need to say what else needs to be shared one time i was um just a couple months ago this kid looked pretty stressed out in his room need to know in the detention center each kid has his own room and He's behind a heavy metal door. It's got heavy glass, and you talk through the door. And he was so troubled because he said, "My mother, I'm afraid my mother's going to be put out, and I might get released. I I won't have a home to go to. Um, can you get in touch with my mother?" He was really stressed out, and um, so actually we did get in touch with his mother, and we found out what the problem was. We were able to help her. Because he thought for sure he was going to get released and his mother would be staying in a shelter because that had happened before. Where they, can you imagine a family having to stay in a shelter? But um, so, I mean, th those kind of um, little success stories uh, happen once in a while, too. So a lot of the time, the su success stories, um, they're kind of underplayed. Um, we need to expose more of these success stories, more of these people that come from this neighborhood. I was talking with a lady and she was telling me how great she grew up in Inglewood and I'm this big real estate agent. But I said, you need to bring that story back because my kids need to hear that. Right. They, the only thing they hear good is that the guy on the corner got a new car and it's got rims on it. But we need those stories, those people that, because a lot, uh, Inglewood, I mean, this this area has a lot of enrichment. A lot of people come from here, and it's a shame that they don't come back and say that, hey, this is how we did it, and bring those stories back and give people hope. Because a lot of times things are visual, and when we see it, and, you know, those kids see it like, man, you know, he's from right here where I'm at, you know. I remember going to, when I went to CVS and I found out that, um, the basketball, um, what is Grant Hill went there? I was like, oh man, you know, I felt, uh, you know, it, it gave me motivation, you know. Uh, so those people need, I mean, I would love to see those success stories bring it back. And even the ones that's being created now, the ones when p kids go to the high school or when they make those milestones and go to college, we need to just raise them up. Some of our kids going to college right now. Yep, right? So, yep. yep. We need to shine that light on them and mm -hmm. say, hey, outglow a lot of the darkness that's so uh, this obviously we just touched on some of the issues and our time is running very very thin and i'm getting uh not nods but looks i can tell that they'll wrap it up so uh <laughs> we're gonna have to wrap this up but what we want you to do is know that this is just the beginning that we really are just scratching the surface of some of the some of the needs and some of the joys of this kind of work so a couple of calls to action i think you're supposed to i'm supposed to call to action one is visit Come, come to PDMR. You don't have to come in big groups. One reason we didn't do our fall fundraiser is because we didn't think it was a good idea to have these large gatherings. But come, just you come, or come with a small group, somebody from your neighborhood or your parish. Come and visit us and, and, and contact us via Zoom. We'd love to have a, a further conversation via Zoom. Um, also, if you want to um, help out, um, you can sponsor some of our kids in different, different ways and some of the activities that we want them to do. Um, give them an opportunity to have a, a good time and laugh and, and just have a, act like children. Um, we really, obviously, donation. I mean, I'm the executive director, so I'm going to always say 
you know, we need money. We need money to continue what we're already doing, but also to grow. So to be to be that and to to support some of our programming here at PBMR. Um, so there's a lot of lot of ways in which you can get involved, but certainly um, don't let this be the last time you tune in to PBMR. Let this just be the beginning, and you're more than welcome to to come and to participate with us as we as we go forward and hopefully together the village to raise a child together take care of our young people and our families. I really want to thank those who made this all possible. Um, certainly Mitchell, who no one I don't think has even seen, but is behind the scenes. And certainly this would not happen without him and his Surecast AV for do donating his time, his skills, and just his presence here. He has really helped us who are not comfortable doing this kind of stuff to really to, to be our best. So thanks, Mitchell. And for all our staff and volunteers who have been a part of this, certainly I I think they know I, I, I value their, their work here at PBMR, but the panelists uh, for what they have given us, the, the passion in which they uh, come to work and really meet the needs of our young people and our families. And certainly all of you out there um, who are tuning in for, for taking the time on a Monday night, and hopefully this is the third one you took, uh, took part in, but just the, 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 the support and care that you offer us. These Zooms that we're doing are the beginning. We really would love to see you come to PBMR. So um, that's, that would be my final call is to come and visit us and see for yourself, um, change the narrative by being proximate. Let me just end with what we began with, with uh, Margaret Wheatley's words. Know that creative solutions come from new connections. And so we're hopeful that through these panels, we made new connections with you and those new connections can bring forth a lot of fruit. So thanks a lot for being a part of PBMR. Thanks for tuning in. Have a good night and God bless.